It's time now to uh, introduce our first speaker uh, for today. He's the 32nd governor of the state of South Dakota. First elected back in 2010, he's serving his last couple of months in office after spending the last eight years leading our state. Governor Dennis Dugard grew up on a dairy farm uh, between Gerritsen and Del Rapids and never forgot his roots. Since assuming office, he's been a tireless advocate for the agriculture industry, and we're really looking forward to hearing from him this morning. Please help me welcome Governor Dennis Dugard. Thank you. Good morning, and welcome to the Livestock Development Summit. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, this event is a great opportunity, I think, for you to learn about financing, about the opportunities that exist currently in South Dakota for livestock development, and also connect with other farmers or financiers or others who might be helpful to you as you consider adding a livestock unit to your operation. Uh, my wife Linda is here with me. She's backstage. Uh, I'm sure she's listening very intently. She always listens very carefully when I speak, <laughs> or, or not. Uh, but it's been quite a month, hasn't it? New governor, new congressperson, People Magazine identified Idris Elba as the sexiest man alive. They also identified me as alive. <laughs> so I was glad to make the list, you know, even though. Um, I've always looked forward to events like this. You know, growing up on a farm, livestock, everyone had all kinds of livestock when I was growing up. And that was in the 50s and early 60s. We had cattle, we had hogs, we had poultry every year. And um, then over time, uh, agriculture became more and more specialized, and especially in years when grain prices have been very high, some farmers have said, well, gosh, you know, livestock is a lot of work. And I'm making so much money from crop production that uh, I'm going to get out of it. And some have. Well, now, of course, the opposite is true. We've got record production in corn, record production again in soybeans, and year after year we've been breaking records. And so we've got this tremendous productivity and tremendous inventory. Prices are very low. And so now we need to take a new look, if you haven't already, we need to take a new look at livestock on the farm because they can provide a place for that low value crop to go abundant as it is. So today, I think you're going to hear a lot of good uh, information, get a lot of good information that will be relevant to you as you consider that, and I hope you will give every consideration to it. Of course, ag is a major contributor to the South Dakota. It's the number one industry in South Dakota. You all know that. We generate $25.6 billion of annual economic impact. 25.6 billion, that's a lot of money. And we employ over 115,000 South Dakotans. Now you've got about 800, over 800,000 South Dakotans, but some are children, some are older and retired, uh, some can't work for some reason, so our total workforce is around 450,000. And when you consider that more than a fourth work in the agriculture industry. That tells you how important agriculture is to South Dakota. Over the last year, we've received quite a bit of rain over most of the state. Some even got too much rain. And of course, during harvest, we really don't want that rain, so that's been a problem. But um, no question about it, year after year, ag is key to South Dakota. And ag's impact on South Dakota is one of the many reasons that ag development is so important to our state and why it's been one of the top priorities for the people who work in my office during the eight years I've been in office. Now, South Dakota is a great place for livestock development. Why is that? It's because of our access to plentiful feed. I talked about that. We've got tremendous forage crops in addition to our row crops. So whatever livestock you choose, the feed price here in South Dakota is very reasonable. We've also got a very favorable tax climate, no income tax in South Dakota, and that's helpful. And we also have a variety of processing facilities here in South Dakota. 
Uh, with a thriving and growing livestock industry, we also need the ability to diagnose and research livestock diseases. And for that reason, I was a strong supporter of the expansion and addition to our animal disease research and diagnostic lab right here, under construction right now, here at SDSU. Not only would this facility be state of the art, but it will be a great resource in our state for our growing livestock industry. Let's talk about some of the uh, sectors in our livestock industry. And I can't touch on all of them, but I'll touch on some of the larger ones. One of the uh, economic impact studies that was done here at SDSU identified dairy as the most impactful livestock type of operation in terms of its economic uh, effect upon the state. If you have a dairy, then you can do processing of that milk, you can feed the crops that are raised here. Of course, the manure on every, in every livestock operation is helpful to land fertility, but you've got feed mills, you've got labor to uh, haul the milk, um, just all kinds of uh, spin-offs of different kinds of work that occurs if someone has a dairy in South Dakota. In 2011, when I came into office, South Dakota's dairy industry produced 1.8 billion pounds of milk with 90,000 cows. So that's just eight years ago, 90,000 cows in South Dakota. Last year, in comparison to the 1.8 billion pounds of milk, we produced 2.6 billion pounds of milk with 118,000 cows. So we've added more cows and they are much more productive these days. Back when I was uh, on the dairy farm, artificial insemination was the latest thing. You could use the best bull sperm so that the offspring of your dairy herd could be more likely to be good producers. Today, you take the eggs from the best cows and the sperm from the best bulls create an embryo in, in the uh, laboratory and implant your best embryos. And that's very commonly done in South Dakota dairy herds today. A lot of the embryo transplantation or production is occurring in Sioux Falls or south of Sioux Falls and, and elsewhere in our state. Um, and that's why we're able to get more productivity out of our dairy cows today. And, and we're going to see that grow by leaps and bounds in the years to come as well. But just eight years later, we're adding, we've added that 727 million uh, pounds more of milk and only 28,000 more cows. But I do expect, right now, as I said, we have 118,000 cows. <coughs> in the next couple of years, we'll be at <coughs> 130,000, 140,000 cows. I wouldn't be surprised. I talked to someone who's looking at uh, a multi-thousand dollar or multi-thousand cow dairy uh, permit uh, just recently, this month. So di developing and expanding dairy requires producing more milk in our state, but of course we also need to maintain and build processing capacity here. Because one of the things we don't want to do as an agriculture community is produce things that have that are in their elementary stage and ship them out of South Dakota uh, before value is added. We want to take those uh, elementary elements, those first products, milk, corn, soybean, beef, pork, and process them in South Dakota and not ship them out for processing. So we've been uh, intent on uh, growing our uh, processing here in South Dakota. I was just talking with Dr. Vikram Mystery, the head of the dairy uh, program here at SDSU, and, and we are reminiscing about one of the first things I did as governor, along with uh, Dr. Mystery and, and others from Brookings and uh, from the state uh, economic development team. We flew to Chicago to meet with Bell Brands. I don't know how many of you have eaten those little mini Baby Bell cheese wheels that you can buy in the grocery, grocery case. Well, they were making them all in Kentucky, and they were selling more than they can make. In fact, they were making so many they had to import the wheels from France to meet the demand in America. So they knew they had to grow their productivity and they're looking around at what states would be good places to land 
and they decided upon South Dakota and ultimately on Brookings, South Dakota. So right here in Brookings, we have the Bell uh, plant that is, uh, is designed, by the way, to be doubled in size. So really, we have one half of their potential capacity uh, ongoing right now in a production process that's longer than a football field in length. That's just one example. Uh, they came in 2012 with their new $100 million plant. They added almost 400 jobs to the Brookings community and the need for milk from 13,000 cows just to fill the Bell Brands processing each day. Uh, South Dakota's very own Valley Queen Cheese in Millbank is also expanding right now. They're expanding their plant with a $50 million expansion and they're going to increase their processing capacity by 25% with over 5 million pounds of milk per day. All this milk will be supplied by dairies within 100 miles. So most of them are going to be South Dakota dairies. They're going to be also adding another 25 employees to their plant. when They already have a large team of over 200 employees in Valley Queen at, in Millbank. And then finally, the Big Kahuna AgroPure has a dairy plant in Lake Norton. They're expanding their plant's dairy milk processing capacity from three million pounds of milk, that's three million pounds a day, to nine million pounds a day, equal to the output, output of an additional 85,000 cows. So when they triple in size, we need 85,000 more cows to produce that milk. Now you think, well, how many cows can South Dakota sustain, Dennis? How many should we have? Well, when I grew up, I, I mentioned earlier, we have uh, 100 and, what is 115,000 cows, 111, my, my uh, 118,000 now, it keeps changing, 118,000. When I was growing up, we had over 200,000 dairy cows in South Dakota. And they're all in little tiny herds, and they are all producing modest amounts of milk. Very small productivity per cow. Now we're going to be a much bigger scale, but we still will be considerably, have considerably fewer cows in South Dakota than we did when uh, I was growing up. So there's lots of opportunity out there in dairy. What about pork? I don't know as much about pork. Uh, but I do know we've seen growth within our pork industry in South Dakota, and there's great opportunity in pork. With land prices high, producers are looking to the pork industry as a way to grow or bring younger generations back to the farm. This is a great way for young people to rejoin their family enterprise and contribute. It's a perfect place. As I mentioned before, in South Dakota, we have plentiful feed, at a reasonable cost, and processor, we have a great processor in the Smithfield plant, the old John Morrell's plant in Sioux Falls, and we have other processor, processors that are looking at South Dakota as a place to locate. In 2011, South Dakota had 1.3 million hogs uh, under feed in South Dakota. Last year, we had almost 1.6 million. So we're seeing growth in the hog industry, and I think that's just the beginning. I think we're going to see a lot more of that in the very near future. In the poultry area, our poultry population continues to be strong. Uh, Minnesota and other nearby states were really hurt by the avian influenza epidemic. They had to empty so many of their barns, sterilize them, and rebuild their poultry herds. They've gone through all that, but that was difficult for them. We had a little bit of that in South Dakota, but we were very lucky in comparison to our sister states. Very lucky. Those few poultry producers who were affected are continuing to refill their barns and get their population back up to where it was before the outbreak. <coughs> and as I mentioned, as I mentioned, not very many barns in South Dakota comparatively were affected. Turkey production in South Dakota is very strong, and our processing is growing. About this time last year, Dakota Provisions in Huron completed their new expansion on the west side of Huron to increase their ability to cook and furnish finish turkey uh, products. If you go to uh, oh, Panera Bread, the turkey you might be eating may very likely come from Huron. 
We're also very excited about the new Hendrix Genetics Turkey Hatchery in Beersford, where they're under construction, or they may be hatching now. They're very close if they're not. They're going to be at full capacity hatching half a million turkeys every week. Just think about that. Half a million turkeys being hatched in Beersford, South Dakota every week. Those turkeys will be shipped all over the country and uh, they'll be hatched right, right there in incubators in uh, northeast of Beersford. And you can't hatch eggs unless you've got hens that lay them and you need barns to accommodate those hens, and so we have many new laying barns, turkey laying barns. We see most turkey barns around South Dakota are growing barns, where you're growing turkey that you're gonna be eating at Thanksgiving. These turkeys are not being grown for meat, they're being grown because of their good genetics to lay uh, eggs that have good turkey uh, productivity to be grown in those growing barns. So we're seeing those laying barns being built in South Dakota right now. Uh, finally, South Dakota is excited. You may have seen this on television just this week. We're the home of the 2018 presidential turkeys. Riverside Colony, north of Huron, was chosen, <coughs> excuse me, chosen this year to raise about 40 turkeys, from which two turkeys will be chosen, and these two will then make the trip to Washington, D.C. to be the turkey dinner for the president, but as is traditional, we're very hopeful the president will grant a presidential pardon to the tur two turkeys so they can live their lives in peace. But it'll be fun to have our own South Dakota turkeys be the presidential turkeys this year. Um, beef. Cow-calf operations in South Dakota continue to be a very important part, very important part of our state's history. And, remain, and they remain so still today, especially West River. However, we have many opportunities for growth and development in South Dakota for more cattle on feed. And as I mentioned, the same thing is true that was true for dairy, that is true for hogs. We have the feed at a very reasonable cost to add value to our cattle industry right here in South Dakota. We currently have 430,000 cattle on feed right now an almost 5% increase from 2011. So beef is growing uh, on the feed side, not as fast as maybe the others, and partly because processing of beef is very limited in South Dakota. Um, helping to add that value, though, in South Dakota is the Demcota packing plant located in Aberdeen. Many of you will remember the failed northern beef packing plant. That was a greenfield packer built in Aberdeen under the Northern Beef Packers brand. They ran short of capital, and shortly after starting operations, they had to cease operations. They went into bankruptcy. New capital uh, from new owners was infused into the plant, and now <clears throat> they process about 1,100 head a day, and they're doing well. And <clears throat> excuse me, South Dakota producers appreciate having a local plant because the shorter shipping time for cattle means they lose less weight when they're being shipped to some place as close as Aberdeen. And so less weight, of course, means less money lost for our South Dakota producers. And then aquaculture is something you probably don't think about much, but it's starting to poke its head under the tent, poke its nose under the South Dakota ag tent. Right over here to the, uh, I'm getting turned around, yeah, to the West of us, Volga, uh, under construction right now is Prairie Aquatech. That is a company that is processing soybeans uh, using uh, fermentation techniques and enzymes using technology developed right here at South Dakota State University by researchers here. And they're going to transform soybeans into feed that is suitable for aquaculture. Now, if you think about buying a fish, uh, when you go to the restaurant, oftentimes that fish is not caught in the ocean, sometimes it is, but oftentimes that aquaculture might be shrimp or it might be some other kind of aquaculture or fish. They will be produced in fish farms. And to raise those fish in fish farms, you feed them oftentimes fish meal. If I'm a trawler out in the ocean and I catch herring or I'm catching tuna, 
and I catch all these other kinds of rough fish that I don't really want, I can still keep them, grind them up, and use that fish meal to feed the other fish. And that's what often is done. But that's expensive feed. And we've learned that by altering the uh, makeup of the soybeans that we grow right here in South Dakota, we can replace some of that feed. In fact, right now, if you go to the store and buy trout, you might be buying trout that's fed some of that soy protein produced right here in South Dakota. And I fully expect that we'll see aquaculture not just as a buyer of South Dakota processed soybeans, but also as a processor right here in South Dakota. Or we might start to see fish farms. One example of that is, and I guess you, whether you call this a fish or not, but shrimp. Most of the shrimp that is consumed in America, in fact, 95% or so, maybe it's even more than that, in the 90% comes from elsewhere. It's not raised or caught near America. It's from Vietnam, it's from China, it's from other places far away. And that shrimp uh, is suitable for being fed this kind of soy protein. And there's a company right over in Ballatin, Minnesota, that just completed a pilot scale shrimp raising facility. And they've already committed to build, and they have the financing to build a commercial scale shrimp raising facility in Laverne, Minnesota, just across the line from Sioux Falls. And we're working hard at the Governor's Office of Economic Development to attract the sh true shrimp processing plant to the Sioux Falls area where they would like to be. And if that processing plant finds its way to Sioux Falls, as we're hopeful it may, may then they're going to need many more shrimp raising facilities like the one in Laverne. And so whether it's in Beersford or Del Rapids or Hartford or, or DeSmet or other places that are within maybe 100 miles or so of Sioux Falls, I fully expect that it's, it's very possible we'll have shrimp farms in southeastern South Dakota that, again, uh, represent a very good market for our South, South Dakota soy crops and represents another uh, new age form of livestock that farmers can consider as part of their operation. Well, now, sometimes when it comes to livestock development, we get caught up in the excitement of the numbers and we forget about the people. We forget about the individuals like you behind all those numbers and behind all those labels, the ones who are growing our state's largest industry and helping revive our rural communities. And this is an important point to make. <clears throat> if you're from small town South Dakota, it's very difficult to attract Amazon or Google or uh, a medical manufacturer or any other kind of manufacturer to your small town. They want to be in population centers like Sioux Falls or bigger. Amazon wouldn't even consider South Dakota for their headquarters. So what can small town South Dakota do? What can the counties in South Dakota do? Rural development. That is the sweet spot for South Dakota. For all the reasons I recited just moments ago, in rural South Dakota, the biggest and best opportunities to add jobs, add economic growth, preserve the tax base of your county and your city, preserve the numbers in your schools and keep your kids at home finding jobs and opportunity is rural development like that I've described. Livestock production in the countryside and production of those commodities, whether they be crops or livestock, in the, in the small towns. That is an opportunity that truly is there and very uh, available to small town South Dakota and rural communities in South Dakota if you seize that opportunity. So I encourage that. This is the kind of thing that gives a young man, like a, a guy I'm, uh, named Greg, Mike Jaspers, who is one of the hosts of this event, our former Secretary of Ag, Mike told me about this young man named Greg who recent, recently found a way to come back to his family farm. He wanted, with his wife, they have a passion for agriculture. They wanted to come back to the family farm. 
They want to come back to their roots, but mom and dad are, aren't, aren't uh, rolling in money. These days are a little bit tight for agriculture, so how can a guy like Greg and his wife come back and work on the farm and live on the farm? And so to do that, he built a hog finishing facility and the facility, as I said, provides a guaranteed revenue stream. And the manure benefits the soil with the fertility that it adds. And that means increased yield and profit for the farm. It means less cost for uh, Greg's dad and mom. And then Greg's wife opened a daycare in their local community, which was a much needed business. So they've become... Uh, residents of the community that they grew up in and love and wanted to return to, and here's a way through livestock development for that to happen. So we can be encouraged by Greg's story and stories of others like him. They're the testament to the adaptability and determination of South Dakota's farmers and ranchers and a sign of the promising future. As I said, ag's our largest industry. It's been that way since statehood. It's an industry peopled with generations of hardworking, resilient people like you, all giving your all, combining until dark, checking for calves at two in the morning, getting up before dawn to milk the cows or load hogs, moving cattle in sub-zero temperatures. It's hard work. It's hard work. But South Dakota farmers and ranchers are tough, and they're not afraid of work. And that's why I think our ag future is as bright as it ever has been. Thank you very much for having me. Enjoy the conference today.